I want to show you what we've been up to in this barn. I hate talking years now because all of a sudden I'm aging myself. Oops. Do you guys want to know actually like all the bad stuff that happened? Because there's been a lot. Good afternoon. I thought today I would do a little, something a little different. I have been, I've been here on YouTube with you guys for over three years now, and I've done quite a few videos on sheep farming, but this week's been a bit different. Uh, I've had some interviews. It's really forced me to kind of go back in time and realize how this all came to fruition, how this all came to be, kind of the journey on how I, became a sheep farmer, how I am still a sheep farmer, kind of my roots, where I came from, how I was raised, and just kind of kind of the story, the struggles, and the journey to uh, where we are today, which is doing exactly what I want to be doing, and raising the animals that I so truly feel uh, are my calling. It hasn't been easy, and it's been kind of I feel like I just got started. I feel like I'm still learning so much every single day. Uh, but I have been doing this for eight years now. I think what I'll do is take you guys through the journey, my journey into sheep farming, uh, the backstory behind sheep farming, and kind of what it all looks like now and maybe what I'm hoping for the future. I think what we'll do is start across the road in my lamb barn, which used to be my sheep barn, and kind of give you the history on that and show you what we've been up to over there this week, because it's kind of exciting. So right away, I want to show you what we've been up to in this barn. So above my head is an air tube. And what that is, it's a fresh air tube ventilation system my vet designed. So what it does is I have a hole on the end of the barn and uh, there's a fan at the end of this tube. It sucks in the fresh air from outside, blows it through this tube, and then there's holes. See the holes? And those holes are positioned so it will hit the lambs at the right angle and they will actually get fresh air from outside that goes through these tubes. We figured this fresh air system would work the best in here. Uh, I talked to the suppliers the other day and they said the good thing about this thing is um, I believe we can shut off the intake from outside in the winter when it's so cold and you don't want the cold air blowing on the lambs and we can it's got another uh intake that will actually take air from the inside and just recirculate the air so i i don't know much about it yet i just still have to talk to my vet about the final details but it is up we just have to get the electrician in to wire it and uh and then i just have to get some instructions on how to run it I figured I'd get in my seat because this might be a while. I'm a little long-winded. I have always been a farm kid, a farm girl. So there's, there's me and my older sister and younger sister. I am a middle child. Not a surprise to anyone that watches my channel. We grew up on a dairy farm. We were a product of the 80s, which meant extremely high interest rates, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure on my family and on many people that we knew. Uh, growing up in the 80s, of course, we didn't know any different because we were kids. All we knew is that we had to do chores before doing anything else. So if that was sports, which I loved, if that was joining students council, if that was a 4-H meeting, whatever it was, chores needed to be done first. And that has 
carried on in my life as you all see and witness every day. So yes, I did grow up uh, many, many years on a dairy farm till, uh, I hate talking years now because all of a sudden I'm aging myself. Uh, I started university in 1994 and graduated with my degree in 1998. And in that time I met Mark and went from being obsessed with the dairy industry and wanting to do something in agriculture or in dairy to loving field work loving agronomy, loving the way plants grew and everything about plants, uh, probably because I had a little bit of a crush on the man I ended up marrying. So uh, it's funny how they always say, oh, wait till, wait, wait till you meet your partner before you make any life choices. But uh, that's probably bad. And every woman watching this is probably cringing, including me, because I swore I would never be one of those. However, um, the thing with Mark is he shared my love for farming and it was not a hard thing to live with and want to be around all the time. So fast forward, we graduated, I graduated in 1998, we also got married in 1998 and I came to this farm where we are now. Then I was a chicken farmer, so I went from milking cows to collecting eggs every day. Now these are not the eggs you eat, these are actually broiler breeders. So we had roosters and hens. They ran around the barn free range. There was no, uh, there's no cages, no nothing. It was just uh, the only thing that resembled anything were nest boxes. So the, the animals, the hens could go into the nest boxes and lay eggs. And we were hoping that those eggs uh, would be fertile because they went to hatcheries. And then the hatcheries would hatch out baby chicks. The baby chicks would go to broiler farms and then for broilers they raise them for meat. So that's what you would get at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, Swiss Chalet. So that was kind of my life for 13 years. That is what I was doing when I had my kids, trying to balance life. I also helped Mark in the fields. Not a whole lot to say about that whole time of my life except for the fact that work became an obsession because uh, I somewhat lost my identity just as, as a person because I don't know why. I, I don't know if I was lost. I don't know um, if I was struggling mentally. I wasn't sleeping well. It led to uh, somewhat of a mental breakdown, I would say, after years of not sleeping well. And then um, started just really obsessing with with working and I wasn't managing well. Uh, the animal part was fine, but the people part I was really struggling with. It was just layer after layer after layer and it just turned into one day um, making a real hard choice to walk away. We did and it was scary. It was probably the scariest moment of, of my life so far in, in career-wise. I didn't know any different. I had worked really hard to understand the business that I was in. So I was really resentful. I felt like I was the one doing the sacrificing. It took me, took me a couple of years to just uh, come to terms with that and let it go and a lot of self-reflection. And in that period of my life is when we started researching sheep and sheep was never on the radar in my entire life. I knew nothing about them. I'm still learning lots about them. Uh, but yeah, we, we researched sheep. Mark saw that it, was, it had a lot of potential in the Ontario market. So I, I went to my very first infrastructure course and I toured some very modern setup, setup facilities for sheep and I fell in love. They, I fell in love with the systems. I fell in love with the lambs. I fell in love with the fact that they treated it like a business, the, the farms that I went to visit. Uh, very intensive, very uh, driven, and I just saw a lot of what I was leaving in, in these farms that I visited. There was really no looking back after those visits. I, uh, I got home that night and I said to Mark, we're doing this. And that's when we renovated that barn in there. I've done tours of these barns before, so I'll link those videos maybe below in the description if I remember. And uh, you can watch kind of how these all came to be. But I really wanted to talk about the story and that I did not know growing up that I was going to be a sheep farmer, not in a million years. And that you may have ideas and, and a plan and it's okay to walk away from those plans and sometimes 
Sometimes you find a piece of yourself that um, may have been missing in the thing you thought you wanted. This is the old barn. So we started in here in 2012 after renovating. I walked away from the chickens in 2011. We started Shepherd Creek Farms in 2012. And the first thing we did was get, get that, that old pig barn that we were just in. We started with 50 ewes. And through, throughout that year, I gradually got up to about 150, 100 to 150, just buying in stock from here and there and everywhere. After a year kind of passed, Mark and I looked at each other and we started crunching numbers and we said, this isn't going to work if we have to keep buying feed because we grow feed, we need to utilize, we need to utilize our land better if, if we want to keep sheep here and he was also concerned about how much time it took me to do chores because we didn't have things in place to get feeding done in an efficient amount of time. It's Mark's usually my common sense driver here. So yeah, we looked at, uh, we looked at expanding the flock. We talked to our banker uh, and we decided to build that great big barn across the road. And uh, crazy as it was, uh, the one thing it did do because we invested, it did force commitment and dedication. And yes, I know I'm lucky and blessed to be able to build on kind of on demand like that, but it wasn't without sacrifice. It was not without tears. It was not without a constant burning in my stomach thinking that I wasn't going to be able to do it. Um, it was three, 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 at least three, probably truthfully closer to five years of really questioning what I'm doing, but I never gave up and here we are now so i can't even believe it's the same barn actually looking back at old pictures we gutted it all myself and monty like right right to the steel outside uh, we took off the ceiling took out the insulation it was a drop ceiling we took out all that blow-in insulation it was disgusting um, we left the steel on and then built we insulated on top of that and put another layer of steel on the very top on the roof so that's kind of how we did that, and then we added the added the curtains and added the chimneys. So for the most part, and we re uh, we redid the floor. So all it is concrete floor with a raised feed alley, and then the bunks are just wood wood uh, wood manger fronts that I copied from another producer. Um, yeah, and then the only thing we've kind of invested in is again, like I said, those the new air tube. And a couple years ago, we put in the feed proportioner. And that, again, if you can find little ways to be a little more efficient with feeding, we like those quicker paybacks. Um, we kind of try to do some budget budgeting based on um, how quickly these things will pay back and if it's worth doing. We've kept this barn pretty simple, but we have definitely improved improved labor over here. Uh, feeding before we were taking uh, a feed cart and a pail and filling feeders. And now we have these, this cross auger system that, that really, really does help with uh, increasing efficiency in time. This is the barn that I started in. And I still love it. Okay, so that brings us to 2013 when we built this barn, this bright span kind of fabric, fabric roofed barn, you, you could say. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on the, on the barn specs. I've got a couple videos on all that and I will link them in the description below. He's biting my bum, stop biting my bum. I'm trying to concentrate, I'm trying to talk to the people. Stop. Okay, I'm gonna take it in this room because Mark decided to pull the tractor up right beside the barn as I was trying to talk. Uh, so 2013, we did purchase this barn. We 
we built this barn, it was to house 500 ewes. Uh, what I found is less is more, so I uh, my happy spot seems to be around 400 ewes in here uh, for 420, 430. As soon as they start lambing, all of a sudden the barn feels so full. It is nice just to have a little more space in this barn. And I also find it affects their health a lot. Stocking density is something we don't really talk a lot about. Uh, but what I found in this barn is my ewes perform better. They stay healthier. I don't have the losses that I would have uh, with more animals. So, so yes, you can have more lambs uh, throughout the year if I have more ewes. My goal is to have um, the same amount of lambs coming out of less ewes because they're healthier and they're more productive. So my goal is to not be a, a huge sheep producer. I actually just want to do better with with less animals if that makes sense okay where do I begin in this barn uh, we we bought a flock where a guy was dispersing so he was because of health problems he wanted out of sheep farming how I did it was fine uh, but if I was to do it again I would have sourced all my sheep from from day one even from when I had this the little barn across the road I would have sourced like a hundred ewes from one place and one place that I know their their health status so they don't it, it's not that they have to be perfectly clean sheep what because I'm, I'm not sure if that even exists but the fact that they know what they're dealing with and they know how to either vaccinate for it or treat it or just basically give me give me a prescription map of, of what I'm dealing with so I know exactly what's coming in. I know the enemy. I think that's really important for any new sheep farmers to understand and realize is that um, yes, clean sheep is like the North Star. It is the gold star. But I'm wondering if that's just something that we're all striving to be, but it is a really hard thing to actually be uh, without totally closing up your flocks and doing AI and doing all these things. So. Um, I would think it's more important as a new producer to try and buy from one source if you can. Have a relationship with the person. If the person wants nothing to do with you after they sell you the sheep, run away. Because it tells you that they're, they don't stand behind their animal. 2014, 2015 is when I really revamped my flock. Uh, by then I had done some heavy, heavy culling decisions. I had, got, I had between mortality and, um, and culling decisions, I, I probably was down to half of the flock that I started with. And uh, from there, I purchased all from one facility, which were those steel composite You, I call them steel composite, that's not the word for them, they don't really have a name of the breed. So between 2014 and 2015, I brought those in, they became my foundation genetics. And every year since then, I've kept some of their daughters. So their daughters, or some, I have some purebred Rito, so I kept some of the purebred Rito daughters. And uh, I'm just trying to build, build my own um, replacements from that foundation genetics. So let's talk about the boys, shall we? I love my boys. Let's see the boys. I have... What do I have now? Do I have four different breeds? I think I have four now. I have Ile de France, Suffolk, Rideau, and I have these steel composite rams that I bought last December. The Suffolk and the Ile de France I kind of have just for my market side. So my ram lambs and any ewe lambs that, that I don't really, the ewes that I want to breed but I really don't want to keep their daughters for whatever reason, I will try to breed those to the Suffolk or the Ile de France. The Ritos I have to put on those steel composite ewes to make a nice steel Rito cross ewe lamb. I also have the steel rams that I brought in so I can actually put them with the steel composite foundation flock and then I have my own purebred steel animals if that makes sense. I do have to take a few seconds and talk about feed. Health, reproduction, really everything in livestock comes down to feed so that's our crops, how the quality of our hay outside, the quality of our corn, our corn silage that we're trying to get get ready to go here. Everything boils down to a really good feeding program and that might be out on pasture if you have a pasture program, uh, but for, for producers like me that rely on um, stored feed, quality is huge, moisture is huge, 
and amounts and how that always changes depending on your your feed testing uh, is so 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 important so I right away got with a feed company uh, Jamie has been my feed guy probably since 2014 I'm gonna say so we have developed we have a, a love-hate relationship a lot uh, because he will tell me what I'm doing wrong and I hate being told what I'm doing wrong <laughs> But I also rely on him when things go sideways. He is my first call The other person I have on top all the time is my vet and that could be just texting. It could be a phone call so uh, knowing what you're feeding is truly truly uh, part of the magic sauce as to how to keep these animals uh, in good good health and condition and not get overweight that's what I'm struggling with now they're almost they're they're fat um, so I do have to I do have to worry about that going forward but yeah feed and vet is truly a game changer in this business if you want to treat it as a business and do this as a career do you guys want to know actually like all the bad stuff that happened because there's been a lot do I want to tell you all the bad stuff that do I remember or do I block it out? I can tell you a few bad things that have happened. Let's kind of talk about a little bit when we got into this business. We got into this business in 2012. Prices were high. Everything looked good. Everything on paper worked. 2013, the market crashed. Nothing worked. Not only that, um, my results were so, so bad. My first lambing group across the road, my first 13 aborted. So they did not go all the way to, they almost went to term. And the ones that did go full term, the lambs came out really weak and they died about five minutes later. I had no idea what was going on. I sent some to a lab and it ended up being like a little bit of chlamydia, which I fight to this day. So again, know your enemy before uh, stuff goes sideways, which it did immediately with me. Unfortunately with sheep, we learn a lot through the failures. It sucks, but it's kind of, it's kind of what happens. It showed me right away I needed a vet. It showed me right away that I need to get on a good feed system and a good vaccination program. So vaccinations to me are so, so, so key. And uh, I've been doing it ever since that very first flock that came in, that first 50 ewes that came in. I have been on a vaccination program ever since. In 2014, um, I broke my leg. I broke my leg doing chores. And it was the winter and Mark was really busy. So for all those that complain that Mark is never in the barn, Mark has probably got a little bit of PTSD, right, stress, from the year I broke my leg because he was juggling sitting on a commodity board like executive like a pretty busy position he was trying to run our grain farm and he also had to be a sheep farmer for six weeks full-time uh, lambing out 300 ewes so he has put in his time he knew from that time that he was not going to be a sheep farmer he bought me this because uh, he knew the day that I, I was given the green light to work again, I would not be able to get into a skid steer. So this is why we uh, purchased the used Bobcat. Is, that is the history behind it. Um, but it did go to show us that in a pinch, we all have to know how to do each other's job. I knew he would do that right when I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> Sorry guys, I had to come back in here. I hope you can't hear that, but he's cleaning out a sprayer. Some other little things that have happened along the way, some of them have been documented because I have been YouTubing for three years. So if you go way back to the beginning, you will see that I used to lamb a lot in the winter, in the dead cold of winter, and this barn just isn't equipped for a January and February lambing. Not, not for me, not for one person. And what was happening is I just couldn't keep up because the cold weather brings on so many different issues. Frozen water, frozen pails, lambs, lambs freezing before you can get colostrum to them. Um, just uh, lambs getting laid on because they're snuggling up to mom and mom does, doesn't see them. So just, just winter in this barn as much as if there's lambs already here. So December works well for me now because, because the cold weather when there are lambs, when they're older lambs, um, they actually do really well because they don't pick up the bugs. So that works really, really well. But when they're brand new in that freezing cold, uh, it just, it really does add to your workload. March is starting to get a bit better. March and December seem to be those months that are, although they're cold, 
it's not that wind chill of like minus 30, so uh, 30 Celsius. I seem to be able to get around it a little better. I have a little more time to keep lambs alive and thriving. Um, that, and I've just learned a lot over, over the last few years. So uh, that's the one thing I have given up because I failed at it. Kudos for everyone that winter lambs because it is, it is hard with a really cold barn. Um, most people, if they lamb in the winter, they've, they're prepared for it. They've got um, better facilities they're a little bit warmer even around zero is good because your your water's not going to freeze and and the animals will stay will stay good at zero it's um it's when you get under that it becomes a little bit of a problem some other things that have happened through the years that you guys have been with me along the way is you know a big storm hit last year took off half my roof they had the roof up in less than a week again and uh, and that finally got completed this spring just uh finally that final stretch and the cut but all the side things that happen because of that the rain that comes in the flooding the just just things that just kept going sideways because one thing isn't right and i find with farming that can be what happened when all systems are a go everything works really good but when one thing is out sometimes it just is a ripple effect if you are just new to sheep farming or you're looking at sheep farming um, i'm sure you're watching this for some advice or for some tips i'll probably give you my top five and the first one is uh try to buy your stock from one from one place i mean that might be different. The ewes might come from one place, the rams might come from a different place because your breeds might be a bit different. And that's cool, but just always be aware every time you bring in animals from different sources, you have the potential of bringing in new bugs. It's no different than kindergarten when we send all our kids to kindergarten and they haven't had any exposure to any other kids and then they come home, they're sick till Christmas. We just, we just know this. Now this year is completely... <laughs> I probably don't have to explain viruses to you. Health issues can can kind of rear their ugly head when you least expect it or when you least want it. Number two, uh, really, really figure out how you're going to manage your feed and what that looks like. Are you are they going to be outside? Are they going to be inside? You know, are you buying feed? Are you growing feed? Feed can be the thing that keeps you in business or pushes you out because it affects everything it affects reproduction it affects the health it affects your bottom line just in the cost of feed in and feed out even the size of your animal depicts how much feed you're going to use in a year so so even though some breeds look really really nice um, if if you can't get production out of them and you have to feed a really big animal you have to be just really really aware of what that looks like economically health is so 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 critical so work with a vet if you can even if that just to just establish a relationship that you know you can just text whenever and and get some and get advice or you can show a picture of something gone wrong and they can if they can't be here at least they can walk you through stuff so I would say um, health will be one of those things you're always learning it's it, there's new things all the time especially during lambing you think you've seen it all and uh, I guarantee you haven't seen everything. Number four, figure out your efficiencies. At the end of the day, sheep farming, ha um, it doesn't have to be a business. That's not what you're in it for. For me, I'm in this um, to be economical, to, to be a business, to be able to stand on my own. We do some enterprise accounting, so we do have a lot of stuff broken down, but at the end of the day, there's so many things that we share. I do rely on the grain side for good feed. Know your efficiencies, like what do you have available for you? Is it a barn, is it pasture? And, and learn that management system. Learn how you're gonna be the most economical and efficient doing it. Um, if it's gonna take you all day to feed 50 sheep, then you need to look at figuring out a way to do that in a half an hour. Um, so just things like that that I've learned along the way is to, to know your system, know what will know your system and know the economics behind it. And I would say the fifth thing is know you, know you, know your management style, know what you like. If lambing is something you want to do once a year, develop a system that you that's an annual lambing system and maybe you can lamb outside if you have a pasture based system. If you like lambing all the time, that's your favorite thing to do and you want to go, 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 go and you want to have cash flow all year long uh then the an accelerated system like mine and mine isn't even an intensive one there there's some that are a lot uh shorter time between groups then look at that so figure out 
you and how you manage your animals and go with a system that will work and that you won't burn yourself out. I was lambing every six weeks. I am now lambing every 12 weeks and that has made a huge difference to the feeling of burnout. Anyway, that's kind of how I have gotten here. I didn't even talk about my YouTube journey. I've talked about that in other videos, but I did start YouTube in 2017. It has been a long road. It has been probably, I thought sheep farming was hard and really hard on my ego. YouTube has, has um, been as hard. I've gotten to the point now where I just, I love the community that's here. I feel comfortable talking about my journey to you guys uh, and I just feel like there's been enough new people that have joined the channel that they really don't know who I am and where I came from. Just know that you are coming in into my life after eight years of struggling, really struggling. You know, even personally I've had a lot of things that have happened. Uh, I had a bit of a breakdown and I lost, um, for the first time in my life, I lost I lost a, a dear friend. Death, uh, no matter who or who it is, is challenging. But when it's a when it's a close friend, it stays with you and it pops up when you're like most vulnerable. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of things you've been along for, which is amazing. Um, but please know that I'm not here to ever uh, gloat or show you how good life is because everyone has a side you don't see. I try to show you everything. I try to show you the bad as, as well as the good. I do believe that most of my audience wants me to succeed. So I do try to show the successes, but humbly enough that you don't think I'm here bragging or gloating because I have so, so far to go. I am not that, I'm, I'm, I don't even consider myself a a good sheep farmer. I consider myself a, a, a student and I'm still learning and and the reason I have the channel is to bring you guys along with me and, and along this journey. This has been really long-winded. My throat hurts. It's not COVID, don't worry. It's just me talking too much. I will cut out probably three quarters of this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this journey. If I've missed anything or you want me to talk about an area that I missed, please let me know in the comments below. And again, if you have been with me from the very start in 2017 and you hit that subscribe button, I love you so much and thank you. If you hit that subscribe button today or yesterday or a second ago, I love you just as much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for celebrating the successes with me. And thank you for crying when I'm crying. Here's to showing up for you guys, showing up for my animals, and, um, and just constantly trying to improve and be better and to be a better person. I love you guys. We will see you soon. The Lammies are coming.